together to pray uh, for the situation we find ourselves in right now. Uh, this is a song based on the Lord's Prayer. And please join in with the singing and later on as we uh, pray for some specific things. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your presence here with us in our living room and wherever we find ourselves. Thank you for the prayer that you've taught us and help us now to bring our prayers to you and to meet you in this place. God in these times that his kingdom will come. Call out to God in these times of isolation, disease and fear that he would make himself known to the people that we uh, know, that you know and care about. So let's name before God right now any people you know who need to know God's kingdom come in their lives today. sing out over these people. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. Let your Let 
Secondly, let's uh, pray to God for our healthcare systems. Let's name before God any doctors, nurses, hospitals, and other people who are caring for the sick at this moment. So let's pray that God's kingdom will come over these medical teams. for our governments and our institutions. So let's name before God uh, politicians, leaders, businesses, organizations that are on your heart. Good morning, King's Court friends, family, and those who may be watching online for the first time. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us on this Father's Day Sunday. We want to acknowledge and celebrate dads today. To the dads, grandpas, spiritual fathers, godfathers, not the Marlon Brando type, to the stepdads, to those fostering, to those single parent dads, and those that stepped up to be dads, brothers, uncles, friends, we thank you for your faithfulness in raising God's children. I want to take a brief moment, if you'll indulge me, to personally celebrate and thank my dad, to the one who taught me to ride a bike, how to water ski and kneeboard, who took me fishing, hunting, and to all his sporting events. To you, my dad, who instilled in me the values of integrity and honesty, of using my voice and to be a strong, independent woman, and who I am pretty sure I get my creativity from. Thank you for always being my biggest cheerleader. Thank you for being generous with I love yous and making sure that each of us know how proud you are of us. Well done, dad. You endured all the trials and tribulations I put you through. And well, look how good I turned out in the end. Thanks, Dad. I love you. Happy Father's Day. Okay, Dads, let's go ahead and get started, guys. <laughs> 
Now, some of you have already let me know how uncomfortable you were in last week's meeting. So tonight, we're going to try to respect each other's boundaries. What? Tonight, we've also got a guest with us, David. And would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, hey, guys. I'm David. David. What's up, David? Hey. How many kids do you have, David? None. At least not at the moment. Uh, my wife is pregnant, and uh, she should be delivering any day now. Mm, that's great. Thank you. Super. Oh, great. Awesome. Who'd like to go first? Anyone. Anyone. I'll go. Perfect. Todd? Yes. My daughter and I went to the mall, and she said she wanted to take the stairs to the second level. And I said, I don't trust stairs because they're always up to something. <laughs> Todd, I'm sorry that happened. Okay. I encourage you to try to resist the urge to make jokes like that. My turn? Okay. Can I go? Okay. Yesterday, actually, my daughter got home and she asked me how my day was. And I said, well, a guy tried to sell me a coffin, but that's the last thing I need. Oh, Jerry, oh, Jerry that Jerry. joke was dead on arrival. Because it's the last thing I need. David, <laughs> how about you? Oh, I, I didn't, I didn't say this. This is a safe zone. Just jump on in. Yeah, I, I'm, I guess I'm just scared of being a dad. I'm afraid I'm gonna start telling bad jokes just like my dad. Well, it might be in our nature. We can fight against it. Hey, speaking of nature, I tried to catch some fog yesterday. I missed. <laughs> M-I-S-T. Oh, You're a monster. I... This is where the boundary is. I'm done. This is where you are. Hello? Really? Okay, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I'll be right there. That was Julie. Her water just broke. I guess the baby finally ran out of womb. <laughs> I'm gonna be a dad. Don't you think it should be going? Oh, yeah. So I told my wife she drew her eyebrows too high. She seemed surprised. We also want to acknowledge and remember and honor those who are grieving today. And so we light the blue candle of mourning. We light this candle in remembrance and acknowledgement of those who are grieving the loss of their fathers. Those who grieve having never known their biological dad. Those who are desiring to be a father but are met with struggles. Those who are experiencing a strange relationship with their father or fathers with their children. To those fathers and grandfathers who are grieving the loss of a child, we see you. God loves you and we are praying for you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the nurturing we have received in our lives from sources both hidden and obvious. We ask for healing from the losses that are highlighted by Father's Day. Equip us, Lord, to nurture each other and the generations to come. May the friendship and love we have in our lives today ease the pain and amplify the positive memories of our past. We ask, God, that this be a day of reconciliation and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, as we come to worship God, we acknowledge that God is gender full. God is neither explicitly male nor female. God transcends gender, and in doing so, encompasses the beauty, power, and diversity of our genders. Whether male or female, God can relate and understand all of our unique experiences. We are each created in the image of God. And this image of God is reflected through us, whether we be male or female. So whether you relate to God as father or mother is totally okay. God is our perfect parent, providing, protecting, 
restoring and reconciling. God loves you. Whether male or female, we are all God's children, holy and dearly loved. God loves you, but I'm his favorite. I'll say it again. God loves you, but I'm his favorite. Parents, have you ever experienced your children discussing, arguing over who is your favorite? I think all of my siblings would agree that my sister Krista is my mom's favorite. I would say that I am my dad's favorite, but I'm pretty sure all my siblings would disagree with that and take that title for themselves. Parents, is your response the same as my mother and father's? Oh, don't be silly. We love you all equally. Now, I'm sure this is true, but while they may love us all equally, it's also true that they love us each uniquely according to who we are. Parents love their children equally, but uniquely, at least as they follow the example of God, our Father. But as our scripture will reveal, even the best dads, even the father of many nations may fall short sometimes. And when they do, there is a heavenly father who will see them and us through. Would you open your Bibles or your Bible apps with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 21, as we read verses 8 to 21. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son. For that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your servant woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. In our story today, we have an example of a father who loves his children equally but uniquely, an example of a father who struggles to do the same. To provide some context, God had promised Abraham that he and his wife Sarah would give birth to a child, to a son, and that through this son, all the nations would be blessed. Well, Sarah thought this is a ridiculous notion and laughed at God. It seemed impossible to her that she, being well beyond childbearing years, could give birth to a son. 
as time went on, and Sarah remained without child, she exerted her power and privilege by insisting that her husband Abraham impregnate their foreign slave girl, Hagar. This was Sarah's solution to the problem. And yet, like what often happens when we don't trust God, when we think we know better, when we believe our ways are better than God's ways, our human solutions often turn into problems. Can you think of ways that we as a society have even with the best of intentions thought that we knew better and so chose to do things our way instead of God's way and in the end it resulted in more problems? I wonder if eliminating the Sabbath is one of those things. It seems to me people of all faiths and no faith are now in the midst of COVID-19 recognizing the benefits to our health, our environment, our relationships, of having a communal time of rest. Have you ever consciously or unconsciously not trusted the ways of God, took matters into your own hands and paid the proverbial price for it? Sarah's plan works, Hagar, Hagar does get pregnant and gives birth to Abraham's son, who is named Ishmael. Sarah is perhaps pretty pleased with herself, thinking that she has helped both God and Abraham out. The promise can now come to fruition. Abraham now has a son, an heir. You're welcome, God. However, approximately 14 years later, when Abraham is 100 years old and Sarah 90 years old, she gives birth to the son God had promised them both all along. His name is Isaac. Isaac, however, is now the second son, not the firstborn son of Abraham. And in ancient Near Eastern culture, it is the firstborn son that gets the double portion of the inheritance. It is the firstborn son who is heir. It is the eldest son who assumes the place of privilege. What once seemed an easy solution to Sarah has now turned into a big problem. A problem in Sarah's mind that had to be dealt with. A problem that had to be disposed of. The text says that Sarah noticed that Ishmael was mocking her son Isaac. Now this may be true. Maybe now, 17 years old, Ishmael was making fun of his toddler brother Isaac. However, it could also be that the word used for mocking here is a play on words, as it shares the same root as the name Isaac, which means to laugh or play, suggesting that perhaps Isaac was simply celebrating along with others at the feast the joy of his brother now going from a crying baby to a toddler he could be more involved with. One could also literally translate playing as Isaacing. That is, Sarah saw Ishmael playing the part of Isaac, pretending to take Isaac's place as heir of the promise. She sees him as a threat. Either way, Sarah uses this as an excuse to get rid of the competition, to secure her son's place and inheritance. And once again, we fail to see her consulting God. Instead, she knows how to fix this, and she's going to take care of it her way. She tells Abraham to get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. Can you hear the indignation in her voice? She doesn't even call them by name, the very one she used to secure what she wanted. After more than 14 years of servanthood, after being the surrogate for the child they thought would solve all of their problems, be the answer to the promise, Sarah now refers to Hagar as slave woman and that woman and her son. Now, it may be that Sarah recognized how much she messed up by not trusting God in the first place. And maybe now she's simply trying to backtrack and somehow make it right by getting rid of Ishmael and his mother 
in order to ensure God's covenant would be fulfilled through her son, Isaac, as God originally intended. Though I can't help but think that if God can have it, that a 90-year-old woman can give birth to a child, then I'm sure cultural customs would not be an insurmountable obstacle to God's plans and purposes. So it may also be that Sarah is more interested in using her power and privilege to ensure that her son is afforded the same power and privilege, willing to rob Ishmael of his privilege as a firstborn son of Abraham and leave both he and his mother powerless. Perhaps there's a little bit of both of these motivations wrapped up in her plan. Either way, Sarah is forcing Abraham to pick favorites. What is interesting is Abraham's response to Sarah regarding disposing of his firstborn son. See, Abraham did not say, are you serious? There is no way I am sending my son and his mother into the wilderness to die. How dare you even think such a thing? How could you even ask me to choose between my sons in such a way? I love them equally and uniquely. Sarah, this was your idea from the start. This is your doing. I will not do as you request. Abraham does not say this. He does not seek to defend his firstborn, to protect his child. It simply says he was distressed. Well, I should certainly hope so. Some customs in ancient Near Eastern culture would require that Abraham claim Ishmael, the son of the servant woman, as his own, or release him to freedom. This is the choice that is distressing Abraham. And in his distress, in his weakness, in his confusion, God comes to him and says, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Now, at first glance, this may seem a cold-hearted, uncaring response from God. Don't worry about it, Abraham. Just do as your wife says, for it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. It seems to me that God's promises still could have come to fruition through Isaac without casting off Ishmael and Hagar. So I wonder why? Why tell Abraham to do as Sarah has suggested? Perhaps it's because God knew that while Abraham might like to claim Ishmael as his own, he knew that Abraham struggled to stand up to Sarah. Really, if Abraham had stood up from the beginning, they wouldn't be in this situation in the first place. If Abraham had initially trusted God more than he trusted Sarah, he would have waited for the promised child Isaac. Perhaps God knew that Abraham would struggle to be the kind of father to protect his children, willing to sacrifice them to the wilderness, willing to sacrifice them on the mountain. I wonder if God knew that should Hagar and Ishmael stay, their lives would be at best miserable and at worst in constant threat from Sarah. Because even when God tells Abraham one thing, Abraham is inclined to follow whatever Sarah says. When Hagar was pregnant with Abraham's son, with Ishmael, she certainly didn't feel protected from Sarah. After enduring constant harshness, constant harassment and abuse, she escapes and flees to the wilderness. But a pregnant single woman in the wilderness can be a death sentence. So God encourages Hagar to return home, but to return with a promise that she would give birth to a son. Despite how it might look, in telling Abraham to do as Sarah says, God is not choosing favorites between Isaac and Ishmael. God is not favoring one and disposing of the other. 
Rather, God is loving them both equally and extravagantly and uniquely, which is what Abraham is struggling to do. Listen to what God says. Do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Where Sarah could only see one possibility, an us or them possibility, only an either or solution to the problem she created, either Ishmael goes or Isaac gets little to nothing, God sees redemptive possibilities where all his children are invited into his plans and purposes. Hagar's son is now 17, 18 years old. He'll be able to provide for he and his mother. And more than this, not only will Hagar and Ishmael survive, but they will thrive as God promises to make the son of a slave into a nation. God has worked Sarah's mess together for the good of Hagar and Ishmael, the very ones she has oppressed. Now they will not only be free, no longer a slave woman and her son, but Ishmael will become a great nation. If you ever felt like the black sheep, if you have ever felt abandoned, discarded, abused, overlooked, unprotected, unwanted, unfavored, God's heart breaks for you. Where your earthly father may have struggled, may have messed up, may have failed, maybe even abandoned you. Know that your heavenly father loves you. He loves you extravagantly. He loves you equally and uniquely. He loves you perfectly. He loves you and he will never leave you or forsake you. Cry out to him as Hagar did and know that he is listening. In fact, the name Ishmael means God will hear. Know that he will hear you and that he will lead you to places of healing and freedom. Be encouraged by these words from verse 20. God was with the boy. The abandoned son of Abraham is not abandoned by God. God is a heavenly father who is father to the fatherless. God does not need to choose between his children because there is blessing enough for all. God does not pick favorites among his children. The promise God made regarding Isaac is the same promise made to Ishmael. Both would become great nations. The difference, the uniqueness, is in the calling. Through Abraham's son Isaac, a great nation would be birthed with the unique calling to bring blessings to the nations and flourishing to all people. They would be a people called to intentionally live and love in such a way as to demonstrate faithfulness to God and to reveal the love and faithfulness of God to others, to live into and live out the redemptive purposes of God. Ultimately, serving as the people, as the lineage through which Christ, the Savior of the world, would come. Christ, the Savior of the world, not the Savior of a nation, not the Savior of a specific people group, not the savior of a certain ethnicity, not the savior to a certain political leaning, not the savior of those of a particular denomination, not the savior of those of a particular socioeconomic bracket, but the savior of the world. Christ, our redeemer, does not choose one over the other, does not love one more than another, but extends the same promise to all. Trust me. Trust in me, and you will become my kingdom people. With the unique calling to continue my mission of restoration and reconciliation. 
As one author has said, to attend to, bless, and embody God's love and care to those outside of the community of Christian faith, particularly those who are most vulnerable. Just as God loves the Hagars and Ishmaels of our world, so should we. God loves us all equally, extravagantly, and uniquely. Which, to put it plainly, is to say God loves us perfectly. God's covenant promise to Abraham comes to fruition, as God's promises always do, even when we get in the way. Abraham would become a great nation, called to bring blessings to the nations and flourishing to all people. But Abraham and Isaac's being chosen by God is not at the exclusion, discarding, or ignoring of others. God's care, God's provisions, God's love is offered to each and every one. God loves Abraham and Isaac, but God also loves Hagar and Ishmael equally but uniquely. God was and would continue to be present with and care for Abraham, Sarah, and all their children, but so too was God with and would continue to care for Hagar and Ishmael and all his children. God loves you. God loves me. God does not have favorites. He loves us equally and uniquely. And he calls us as people of God to go and share that love equally and uniquely with others, extravagantly. That we should continue to grow in love for God and all others. Let that be true of God's people. Let that be true of God's church. As we seek to see his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.
And now, as you go into your world. We love you, Teddy, but God loves his children. May you find your identity in being a son of the only perfect father. May you make it possible, make it impossible for your daughters to ever find a husband as good as their dad. May you teach your children that their mother is the most beautiful woman alive. She's really pretty. May you risk more, worry less, and play hard. May you lead your family, not as a king, but as a servant. Who protects their heart, protects their hearts. May you laugh at the little things, the little things. And finally, and finally, may you lay down your life for your family. And may you introduce them to a God, to a God that's already done that exact thing. We hope that you have a great day today. Great day today. Have a great day today. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storms. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again in his perfect timing through these doors. Go knowing the grace of God. His extravagant and perfect love go with you. Go sharing the love of God, the unique, extravagant, equal love of God with each person you come into contact. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>